thing. Our uh, colloquium speaker um, is uh, Mamchil Malnar from uh, CEU and NSO. Um, Mamchil got his B BSc degree from MIT in 2016 before coming to CU Boulder to pursue a PhD in solar physics. Mamchil is currently finishing his dissertation project of estimating chromospheric wave heating based on high resolution spectroscopic data combined with spectral synthetics from state of the art MHD solar models. He is currently co advised by Professor Stephen Cranmar at CEU LASP and Dr. Kevin Riordan at NSO. Mamchil will be graduating next year, 2022, and is looking for opportunities to keep working here in Boulder. And uh, Mamchil is um, called Momo in short. <laughs> I like that name very much. And he will be talking today on constraining the acoustic wave heating in the solar chromosphere with uh, Alma, DST, Ibis, and Iris. To Mamchil now. Uh, thank you. Can uh, everybody hear, uh, hear me well and see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome, thanks. Uh, well, uh, before I start, uh, hi everyone, my name is Momcho from, or Momo from CU Boulder, and uh, today I will present some of my recent results on constraining the amount of wave heating in the solar chromosphere using ALMA, the IBIS instrument, the solar telescope, and IRIS. And I wanna thank, uh, before I start, my both my advisors, uh, Kevin Reardon and, and Steve Cranmer at CU and NSO, as well as all my collaborators who are listed below, and the awesome observing staff at the at the observatories which made the studies happen and as well i want to thank the organizers for letting me speak today so the motivation for this talk is that we have a long-standing chromospheric heating problem which constitutes that the, we don't know what's the physical mechanism that balances out the relative losses of the chromosphere uh in the for the solar chromosphere uh which could be either quiet uh and and darker these chromospheric losses are about four kilowatts per square meter per square meter and and an, about an order of uh, order of magnitude more in the more bright and magnetically active uh chromosphere like in pleasure and active regions they can be even like two orders of magnitude more as shown recently by diaz basso at all so th this has been a long time problem and there's been uh, a lot of different mechanisms which have been suggested for how uh, this heating could happen uh, but today i will um, I will do, I'll only present observational constraints on the wave heating in the chromosphere from acoustic waves propagating from the convective overshoot. And there's a lot of previous work uh, on this topic. Some of the articles are, are shown here, and I, uh, if you're interested, you should check them out for sure. So uh, before I start, I want to define two questions I'm going to ask. So if you're not interested in those, Feel free to leave. But the one question I want to ask is how much energy flux acoustic waves can deposit in the solar chromosphere? And the second question is can we constrain transfer wave amplitudes from center to limb variations of the chromospheric velocity fluctuations? And in this case, I'll be talking about more like alphanic waves. But this also ties into the, the idea of the missing heating, uh, or like the, the mysterious heating uh, physical mechanism of the solar atmosphere. So, a bit of background before I start talking about. My research is that there are a lot of mechanisms uh, proposed for heat uh, to heat the chromosphere. Uh, one of the strongest contenders is because of small scale magnetic reconnection, which just says that uh, ma magnetic fields all, all around the sun reconnect all the time, and during the magnetic reconnection, a lot of heat is uh, being released in the in the solar atmosphere, and this maintains the relative loss of the uh, chromosphere. There's been a lot of uh, recent work with the advent of high resolution observations. Uh, and for example, one of the excellent studies by Goshi Chateau from 2018, uh, where they used inversions of iris observations and some SST data, I think, showed that uh, even though on locally these uh, magne like, uh, magnetic reconnections could provide enough heating, their occurrence rate is not high enough on a global scale to uh, to heat the, the solar chromosphere. But I think Dikast and uh, Dikast and VISP and all of the other polarimetric uh, instruments on Dikast will provide uh, significantly better constraints just because of the high resolution we're going to have. 
Another um, proposed mechanism is, is ohmic dissipation of electric currents, in, um, in, especially in the magnetic chromosphere. But recent observations from what I've seen in the literature don't, uh, don't really show that there's enough, uh, it, it, there's enough current density um, dissipation from observations uh, for, for this to be a viable source to maintain the active magnetic, uh, magnetic chromosphere. So uh, uh, today I will discuss the third strong contender for uh, the, the uh, chromospheric heating problem solution is that acoustic waves or like sound waves uh, or like in general MHG waves from the photosphere which are driven by, a, by the um, uh, convective overshoot could propagate, which propagate upward, could dissipate their energy in the chromosphere due to their um, Due, due to their either steepening into shocks or like some other um, mode conversion mechanism. And there's been in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of very interesting studies. Uh, for example, in the in the early 2000s, in the late 2000s, uh, Wunenberg and Bell Gonzalez et al. have published a few very interesting papers where they use uh, photospheric velocity observations to measure how much uh, velocity fluctuations we observe in, in the photosphere. And based on 1D modeling, they were able to obtain uh, the marked in green here uh, estimates for acoustic waves in the photosphere. And you can see that these numbers are greater than the four kilowatts per square meter I mentioned before. So if we can, if these waves can somehow travel from the photosphere, from the photosphere to the chromosphere um, and they dissipate their energy, they're, they're a viable source of energy, uh, a viable source of heating. Um, more um, similar work, but with tracing the UV by Folsom and Carlson, uh, has shown uh, the opposite result. They used uh, the trace continuum in the 16 and 1700 filters, and they coupled their observations with uh, uh, with 1D time-dependent uh, hydrodynamic modeling with the Radin code. And they found that actually these waves, which are uh, these waves, uh, have an order of magnitude less uh, uh, flux than what was, what was observed before. In the previous studies, but there's been a lot of follow-up work by um, Vedemar Bohm and uh, Kunz uh, in 2007, 2009, I think, which show the, these conclusions are actually very model-dependent, and the observations due to the limited resolution of trace might be oh, so, I'm sorry, underestimating the amount of acoustic flux there is. So stepping into uh, the last few years with the advent of like very high-resolution observation observations, I was found to show that actually. Uh, if you if we use um, slit spectrographs on the ground with adoptive optics and we observe the velocity fluctuations in um, the H alpha, H beta, and the calcium eighty five forty two lines, we actually they infer that there is about a one kilowatt or more acoustic flux that's being deposited uh, in the solar chromosphere, and this is uh, the, in this case they used one uh, D time uh, like static models, foul like models to interpret their uh, observations. And they also found some very other interesting results, for example, uh, constant phase shifts at, at high frequencies uh, using iris. But I'm not going to talk about this today too much. Either way, uh, so from this short literature review, I don't think there's a consensus uh, on the topic. So that, that's where we, uh, and we're going to try to spread, uh, we're going to try to uh, do our own separate analysis by picking the best practices in all of the uh, mentioned before studies. So we're going to use multi-height measurements of the solar atmosphere to study this problem, just because uh, the theory posits that these waves propagate from the photosphere up toward the, through the chromosphere and, and up to the transition region. And by using a combination of instruments which are readily available today, we can have observations of at all these different heights, which is going to allow us to study wave propagation at these different heights and eventually but uh, and consequentially by by knowing how they how these waves propagate we can infer how much of their uh, of their energy flux is dissipated and uh and could be available for heating of the solar atmosphere so the data i'm going to be talking about today is coming from the iris spacecraft which is a uv spectrograph orbiting uh orbiting around earth it produces a beautiful uv spectra on the solar chromosphere. And uh, in, in this study, I'm going to mainly be talking about the Doppler velocity fields, uh, which we can derive from the spectra. And over here, I'm just showing an example one. Uh, 
uh, can you see my, uh, I, I hope my cursor is being seen, but this is like a, an example of the velocity maps. And you can see the two minute waves really clearly in this uh, Doppler velocity of atmospheric line. Uh, I'm also gonna be using ALMA. ALMA is the Atacama large millimeter array, which became available for solar observations uh, recently. It consists of 66 dishes, uh, which uh, from a few observing cycles ago, we can, can observe the millimeter continuum of the of the sun, which is formed uh, supposedly under LTE the, uh, under LTE conditions on the solar surface. So this is pretty variable because not many diagnostics are very tightly uh, tightly coupled to the chromospheric temperature. And last, but uh, the, the workhorse of this study was the IBIS instrument at the Dunn Solar Telescope, which is a two-dimensional Fabry-Perot scanning spectrograph, which produces two uh, D um, spectral scans of the solar surface where at each scan we have a um, basically it's a tunable filter that produces a very narrow um, sliver of wavelength is being cut out from the spectrum and is presented down here and it produces uh, and it produces really awesome and very useful uh, velocity maps which um, which you're going to see a bit later uh, just talk a little bit about alma since it's a more novel um, uh, novel instrument alma uh, radiation is formed in the chromosphere with L, uh, with LTE source function, just because most of this, uh, most of the source function of ALMA uh, is coming from free free scattering. Uh, and over here, I'm I'm just showing which uh, which regions of the solar atmosphere are being sampled uh, are being sampled uh, are being sampled by the different ALMA uh, millimeter wavelengths. And this really nice figure from the Silva Santos. It all shows how ALMA is very complementary to the other diagnostics that we have of the chromosphere, like the calcium A542 or the magnesium uh, double, uh, H and K lines, which is observed by IRIS. However, something to keep in mind is that the, even though the source function of the ALMA radiation is uh, is LTE, uh, the opacity the, the opacity of the millimeter continuum is actually uh, non-LTE because it depends on the ionization state of the chromosphere, and we. We showed that in a, in a previous study where we found like a pretty tight correlation between the H alpha width and the ALMA temperature in our observations. So I will, and this will come handy a bit later when we use ALMA observations to study uh, wave amplitudes. So I'm gonna, now I'm gonna jump into the first question. How much energy flux acoustic waves can deposit in the solar chromosphere? So how do we compute the wave power in the chromosphere? With, uh, the wave energy flux or how much, uh, how much energy flux a wave carries is equal to the wave energy density or like how much wave uh, how much energy is being contained in the uh in a unit volume of uh plasma because of the wave times how quickly this uh this wave energy is being propagated or uh or the so-called group speed as you might have heard of so um and the wave energy density in this study would be just equal to the density times the velocity perturbation of the wave squared because I'm talking about um, acoustic waves. But if you want to talk about uh, MHG waves, we, we just need to swap out the yellow, the quantities in the, in the yellow box with your favorite, uh, with your favorite uh, MHG wave, but then you, you, you might have to measure a few different things. So in this equation, uh, most of the quantities are model dependent and that's very important because uh, most of my talk would be actually constraining the model dependence of our results. So what we can actually observe on the sun is the um, are, is the wave uh, is the wave amplitude but we can't measure either the directly the density of, of the formation of the formation of the spectral line diagnostics or we can't measure uh, really uh, the, the sound speed very well in the solar atmosphere. And what's more, uh, the observed wave amplitudes are actually attenuated because of the relative transfer of the problem. Just because these waves have uh, comparable wavelengths to the formation region uh, of the spectral line in the chromosphere. So, uh, and I have an illustration here, is that, for example, uh, over here for one of our Radin models, that I'll talk in a, in a little bit, the velocity, at uh, the tau equals one surface for the calcium 8542 line is the blue line. But what we actually observe if we apply the radiative transfer of the problem and then we apply the observing pipeline that we use for our real observations 
is the red line. So if we compare the power spectrum, or these are the Fourier transforms of the data squared, and we take uh, well, the absolute value of the uh, of Fourier, we can see that there is a systematic attenuation between uh, a, there's a systematic attenuation between the real power in the uh, in the atmospheric velocity and the observed power that we're detecting with our telescope. So we need to take into account if we want to derive the real uh, the real velocity in the atmosphere and have an accurate estimate of the acoustic flux. So uh, our first study started with utilizing Radin, uh, the Radin model to uh, create realistic models of wave propagation in the solar atmosphere. The Radin model is a 1D is a 1D hydrodynamic code with full range of optically thick range of transfer for hydrogen, uh, calcium, and helium. Um, and it has a lower boundary condition, which is a piston. So we can drive waves, in this case, acoustic waves, propagating throughout the solar atmosphere. And over here, I'm showing one run of this model. You can see how the waves propagating from the photosphere into the chromosphere, uh, their amplitudes grow larger because the density in the chromosphere drops down. And they and they steep on uh, in this case they don't become shocks, but you can still still see that in the in the um, uh, in the spectral diagnostics from this run we can see that the wave waves leave uh, observable imprint. So our um, our strategy was to run a few different Radin models and create a grid, basically a grid of models in which the acoustic flux is. Uh, from negligible, in this case blue, goes all the way to almost uh, maintaining or carrying enough energy to uh, maintain the, the solar chromosphere. But something to keep in mind is that there's almost no real dissipation in the in these models that we run. So that's of the short that's one of the shortcomings uh, of this of this of, of these models. Um, so you using these grid of models we were able to obtain the densities we needed, the sound speeds we needed, and the attenuation coefficients we needed to estimate all the quantities in the equation that I showed you before. So we, based, based on, on these models, we were able to uh, get everything we needed beside the real observations that I'll be talking about in a minute. But there, uh, from the Radin models, something that we saw was that the, these attenuation coefficients don't really change with the strength of the models. In this case, uh, uh, the naming nomenclature is like model underscore the strength, like a relative strength of the driver in, in the in the upper convection upper convection zone. And you can see that these um, tr uh, these transmission coefficients don't really change with the models, which is, which is pretty con um, which is good because it means uh, there's a convergent behavior of these models. Okay, so the last piece to estimate the uh, acoustic power the power of these waves is to estimate the power spectrum. Or the velocity amplitudes uh, for um, the velocity amplitudes from our observations. Uh, in this case, I'm showing our observations from IBIS for the calcium 8542 line, um, and we have segmented our our observations into the different constituting uh, solar regions that we observed. And you can see that the different solar regions have uh, different power spectra of their velocity of uh, their Doppler velocities. Uh, they have different slopes, they have different total power, and have, they have different uh, um, uh, white uh, noise floors. But all of them uh, all of them quantitatively agree with the previous work of uh, Reardon et al. and uh, yeah. So uh, one thing we can derive from this is we can, uh, before I start talking about the wave amplitudes, actually we can derive the slopes of these uh, velocity fields. And some people have argued that the chromosphere is very, um, Turbulent, and that these power laws are actually um, are signatures of turbulence. So we did measure the uh, we did we did measure the slopes for different solar regions, and we see uh, in the top plot this this is the raw data, uh, like the, the slopes from the raw data, and we see that the uh, quieter regions have lower power slopes compared to the uh, more bright uh, features like plage and network. But when we apply uh, the correct uh, when we apply these uh, attenuation coefficient, we can infer what's the real velocity uh, slope in the atmosphere because we're removing the radiative transfer smearing of, of the data, 
uh, of the signal that we're receiving. And we're actually getting numbers for the slopes between, well, the average of these distributions are between negative two and negative a half, which uh, I think means that uh, comparing it with some numerical uh, treatments of uh, turbulence, seems like uh, these results are reproduced by more Eulerian-based approaches as described in Rubinstein and Zhu. Uh, the other thing that we had to explore and understand was the white noise floor of our data. And that's because uh, if we can't understand the systematics of our data, we can't be sure that we are actually observing a real signal. So what we did is we did a Monte Carlo simulation of the expected photon noise of our data by basically taking a few hundred uh, uh, spectra from each uh, spectra uh, from each uh, solar region and running a, a Monte Carlo simulation what's going to be the uh, white noise floor for these different uh, um, sp uh, sp spectral shapes and actually we can reproduce the white noise floor uh, pretty well with uh, this very simple um, with this very simple calculation and this uh, assures us that actually our observations are not are not seeing uh, dominated. And, and that's kind of expected because that day we had really good seeing. Okay, so uh, jumping back into the wave fluxes, uh, we were using the previous formula, the Radin models and our observations uh, for the wave amplitudes. We were able to estimate in the upper photosphere, the uh, wave fluxes based on the sodium D1 line. And we can see that the Internetwork and the fibrils show the most acoustic flux, as shown previously by Jeffries et al., the so-called uh, acoustic portals. But in our study, I th uh, we find that there's not enough acoustic flux really uh, to maintain the, the, the um, chromosphere because the most we get, we get is about one um, the times. Uh, it's like about one kilowatt per square meter. But please pay into uh, into account, like take into account that actually here we are observing only between five and fifteen millihertz because uh, because of the uh, quality of our data. Uh, we were able to obtain on, on the same day uh, for the same solar region uh, very close in time uh, similar ob observations at higher cadence but uh, better seeing where we were able to estimate total amount of uh, wave flux in the calcium to infrared line which is formed somewhere in the, in the middle chromosphere between 5 and 60 millihertz. So we're able to extend uh, significantly to significantly higher frequencies our um, uh, our estimates, and and, the, and these are shown here. You can see that the uh, you can see that the amount of flux in the plage is significantly higher than before in the in the sodium D1 line. But that's uh, that's not to be taken uh, that's to be taken with a little bit of doubt because it has been seen that uh, when uh, the calcium to infrared line is formed in plage and other bright features, actually the core of the line becomes rather flat, and then when we're looking for the line center position uh we are getting uh we're actually uh significantly more sensitive to noise so um yeah, yes uh and, the, and and of course we see the most uh wave flux in, in the internet work yeah so in order to compute the like something like uh dissipated energy we need to find the difference between the fluxes of course assuming uh, some sort of a 1d propagation of the waves and uh just for the region between 5 and 15 millihertz uh, the difference between the two is, uh, is are these histograms. And you can see that the difference between the two is is about, uh, is again between 1,000, uh, sorry, between 100 and 1,000 watts per square meter, which is not enough to maintain the, the, the chromosphere, which is a, a contradicts some previous authors. Um, we wanted to, uh, we had contemporaneous observations with ALMA. So, but in order to interpret what ALMA observes as wave amplitudes, we have to keep into account, we keep into mind that acoustic waves uh, have a velocity perturbation and a temperature perturbation because they're a compressive wave. And uh, we can write out the acoustic flux in its very complicated form for, uh, um, for temperature variations, like, like up here in equation 24.1, but there's a lot of model dependence hidden in it. So we, uh, we run some experiments to see if we can actually just rewrite this, um, this equation as a simple relationship. If, if there's like a simple linear relationship between the amount of flux we're seeing uh, at certain uh, wave frequency and the amount of temp relative temperature fluctuations we see in ALMA at these frequencies. And uh, we, uh, the results for these 
uh, proportionality coefficient between the two are shown over here on the right. And we can see that for the different models, we have a pretty good um, convergence of them, which means that we most probably, um, if we believe Radin is right, um, we can most probably infer the magnetic, oh, sorry, infer the acoustic flux based on the amount of um, relative temperature fluctuations we're observing. So we did that and we inferred the following uh, acoustic uh, wave fluxes from ALMA. Uh, on the left, it's um, the, is the ALMA observations at three millimeter wavelength, which is formed in the upper chromosphere. And on the one on the right is at uh, 1.2 millimeters, which is formed at the lower chromosphere. Uh, and, and again, this is based on the fact that uh, the flux of, uh, of the wave in this case is pro proportional to the uh, square of the relative uh, temperature change. And actually our results agree pretty well with the uh, recent paper by Nindos et al in ANA. But uh, I think our, uh, our estimates are a bit higher, but they did use, um, they did use a 1D file type model. So I think that's where it, uh, the difference is roots. So we were able to compare all of these things, all the aforementioned observations by ALMA and, the, and IBIS, and for the same exact region, uh, for the same exact region shown up here as the small black circle in the left panel, which is the field of view of ALMA. And uh, the results are shown here. And uh, independently of how you, uh, well, ALMA band six is from the lowest, and then it's the calcium, uh, and then it's the alma band tree is formed uh, at highest. But we can see that uh, ne ne we can't get a difference between any of these two diagnostics that's gonna give us a number that's gonna maintain the middle or upper chromosphere, which is uh, which points to the fact that I don't think our data, our data plus our modeling lead to the fact that uh, these waves hit the chromosphere. Uh, but then we also had iris, and iris is great because it observes uh, a lot of UV diagnostics in the upper chromospheric and transition region, and it has a very rich archive as well. So it, it's a great, it's a great tool to utilize. In order to interpret, um, in order to interpret correctly the iris uh, observations in the quiet sun, uh, we start, we utilized the Bifrost score instead of Radin because uh, it it has more uh, realistic upper uh, upper chromosphere transition region and such physics and it's also 3d cold so that that provides us with a better um just a, mo a more holistic and real like model of the, of the sun we used the uh, rh code by Pereira and Oetenbrook to synthesize uh, synthetic observables from the uh bifrost cubes and over here i'm just presenting you an average synthesis of a um, snapshot of the Bifrost cube, uh, a single step from Radin, and an actual UV observation. Um, what we can see here is that actually neither of the models reproduces the upper chromosphere pretty well because the 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 the, 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 the lines I'm talking here about the the sorry magnesium two lines are formed in the upper chromosphere, and. Uh, as we expect, and it has been shown uh, previously, for example, in Pereira et al, 2013, that these models really are missing something that makes the lines brighter and wider. But either way, we're going to use those because they're, even though they they don't reproduce the UV spectra as well as the static 1D models, they're, 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 they're just real models of the sun. They're not just a, a numerical setup that reproduces the spectrum of the sun. So. That's why we're going to proceed with those models. And the other thing I'm going to concentrate my uh, my attention is on this line of the manganese one twenty eight zero point one, which is circle here, is because it's formed somewhere in the upper photosphere and it's always observed contemporaneously with the magnesium lines, which is great because uh, it provides us with a contemporaneous velocity measurement at a different height in the solar atmosphere, and we're all. And uh, that's our end game. So using uh, our radian runs to evaluate the fluxes from the iris data, we get the following uh, the distributions of fluxes. We don't get uh, enough uh, for the plage regions, which I, I, I don't believe our study is very applicable to because they're magnet magnetically dominated uh, magnetically dominated solar regions. We 
don't really get high enough fluxes. But if we look at the quiet sun, we're actually seeing that the, ma the manganese one line that I talked about actually contains uh, on the order between uh, a, few a, few thousand, a few thousand watts per square meter of flux. Uh, when, and when compared to the contemporaneous, uh, sorry, contemporaneous uh, magnesium K3 observations, uh, like over here in the right, we see that the difference between the two is on the order of a few thousand uh, watts per square meter, which is enough to maintain uh, the, the, the quiet sun chromosphere, which, uh, which is a nice result. But uh, how we treat first, how we treated this line, the manganese one, we treated it in LTE based on a Kurtz model because we didn't have a manganese one atom. But I think it's uh, because of its atomic properties, of especially that, tra that, that transition, I think it's a strongly non LTE line. So that's one thing. And the other thing, uh, that I'm going to talk a little bit about is like the 3D models are, make me a bit skeptical about it. And let's look at it. So, Bifrost actually uh, over here with the, uh, I've shown here the synthetic observables from Bifrost. I've, um, I've measured, uh, in this case, I've used the publicly available synthesis of the UV, of the uh, near UV window of iris, which contains the both. Uh, magnesium two H and K lines and the manganese one line, and I've measured what are the observed uh, the velocity fluctuation amounts uh, in the in the model, and they're very comparable to what we're seeing in the real up in, in the real atmosphere, which is great. So, but looking at what are the formation heights in these models is very troubling because if we look at the formation height, for example, the manganese one line, it forms at the height. Between uh, 0.6 and 1.4 megameters, which corresponds to uh, density distribution that's shown on the right. So, which is the right density to take to, to use in that equation that I showed before? And uh, I've shown the density that the Fauci and the Radin models, they're pretty similar. And I've shown them here as a red line. And we can make the same exact argument about the magnesium K3 line. But what this pointing toward is that if we believe that the Bifrost is a more realistic model of the sun, then this means that by using the false densities shown as the red lines here would lead to significant overestimates of the wave fluxes based on these uh, based on these previous works. But of course, Bifrost has, has its own drawbacks. So uh, I, I, I don't think I have a strong, um, I don't think I, I can say the previous studies are right or wrong. I'm just saying that using one model comes with its, ca its caveats. And, but the biggest trouble with using this is the following. So uh, with using the Bifrost model is the following that the, I've computed here on the right, the average density at tau equals one for the uh, tau equals one surface for the line core of this photospheric line I've been talking about, the manganese one line. And you can see it, it, it kind of changes significantly like a few orders of magnitude. But the problem is that if you compute what the temporal change at the tau equals one density is with time, you actually see it over here on the right. This is on the log scale. It changes about an order of magnitude. So this would change your result of the flux by order of magnitude. So uh, yes, so I think that the con this is still a work in progress, but I think the takeaway is that I think in the dynamic solar chromosphere that we've seen, uh, the, there's a high variation of the density of the average formation height, which makes any flux estimate highly model dependent. And by using 1D models, I think we're making a significant overestimation or like a, like a system, systematic overestimation of, uh, of our um, conclusions. And uh, it's, this is still work in progress and I'm still trying to figure out how to find uh, a, a good observable linking to the amount of wave flux in the atmosphere, but I think that's the end goal of this study is to see if we can actually find a good observable quantity based on uh, spectroscopic observations that can point us to uh, amount of wave flux at a certain location. And uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about today is actually constraining the transverse wave amplitudes from central to limb variation of the chromospheric uh, velocity field. And this is uh, uh, <laughs> this is perfectly orthogonal to what I'm, I've been talking until now because I've been uh, up to this point I've been talking mostly about longitudinal waves 
So now I'm going to try to find if we can actually find the transverse wave amplitudes just based on uh, center tooling variation of the amount of uh, wa wave fluctuations we observe. So what I'm talking about is the following. If we have an observer, like, like this eye over here, that looks straight down on the sun, uh, it's just going to see uh, as, as it's gonna see the, the observer is gonna see as an as a Doppler velocity only the projection along its line of sight. So if you're looking straight down at the at disk center, you're gonna see only the uh, velocity com component that's that's exactly pointing straight up from the solar surface. But once you start pointing your telescope more and more closer to the limb, you start seeing the perpendicular to the solar surface component. And if we have a um, magnetic topology in which we have mostly uh, vertical magnetic fields, we could actually, uh, we can actually maybe constrain the alphanic uh, amplitudes observed in the chromosphere. And, and this has been, um, this has been, uh, this has been done in a lot of cases for uh, singular speculars or, or like uh, some other uh, singular structures. But I think this is a way in which we get a statistical average measurement over the whole sun, because if we uh, believe that the, there's a ubiquitous process that's keeping, uh, that's maintaining the solar atmosphere in its thermodynamic state, there should be like this, uh, we, sh we should be able to detect in a statistical way. And the IRIS data, data archive, archive is actually a, it's a great place to do this study because there is a, uh, there's multiple center to limb variation studies, sorry, uh, observational campaigns done for that. And for example, over here, I'm showing the, uh, one of these quiet sun campaigns uh, which observed at five different pointings at mu angles or like cosine of the inclination angle that we're looking down at. Um, uh, that was done in 2013 when the telescope had a little bit higher uh, efficiency and higher throughput. And uh, all the observations I'm going to be talking about are single uh, sit and stare scans because this is going to give us the best, uh, the best, the most optimal uh, cadence and the velocity. Of, um, velocity estimates. So what I'm talking about is, is the following. This is a polar coronal hole observation in the manganese one line. So this is like somewhere up, up in, the, uh, in the upper photosphere. And on the, uh, on the X axis, we have a slit. And on the Y axis, we have the time. And I'm, I'm showing the velocity. And on the left side of the slit is the limb. On the right side is the, is, is the, the slit is pointed toward the disk center. And you can start seeing how the uh, amplitudes of the velocities are on average starting to go down and the signal becomes more weak um, um, more weak on average and we can really see those really nice wave patterns so if we quantify that for example for a coronal hole we compute what's the uh, fluctuation the velocity fluctuations uh, for different mu angles for coronal holes uh, we see this trend here on the left and why I'm talking about coronal holes in the k3 line is because if we believe our, our magnetic field models for coronal holes, we would expect mostly a, a vertical magnetic field. So uh, this presents us with a great opportunity to actually measure what's the alphanic, uh, what's the alphanic uh, component or the transverse, uh, average transverse component uh, in the chromosphere. But the, mo the more confusing thing, the, mo the more confusing observation is the following. If we do the exact same analysis for a photospheric observation in the quiet sun, we would expect most of the magnetic field to be horizontal. And like, for example, over here on the right, I've shown a, uh, I have shown a snapshot of a Bifrost quiet sun run at about the same height as the formation region of the, of the uh, manganese one line that um, I'm showing on the right. We see that most of the magnetic field is horizontal, but we see a very similar uh, trend. We see a very similar trend of the uh, observed velocity fluctuations, and uh, and, and just for posterity, I've also calculated the amount of um, I've also calculated the amount of relative intensity changes in the manganese one line and in also in the in magnesium lines, and we see similar behavior that we don't really see a very strong uh, change in in those, which means that we're seeing the same like the same acoustic or you can think of them as like slow modes or like, uh, the same amount most uh the same amount of um uh compressive waves like wherever you look at the sun so if that's true 
then we would expect, uh, yeah, we should be able to um, separate the two uh, phenomena. So just a tiny little to explain our observations before I jump into the more uh, into the more full solution is the following. We can take um, two different um, magnetic field topology models. For example, over here I'm showing uh, like a coronal hole model at the top, a before uh, at about two megameters, where we see most of the magnetic field is straight pointing up. And then we can take one that has a mostly horizontal magnetic field topology, like a quiet sun canopy type of situation. And um, we can pay, we can um, compute what, depending on the inclination of the magnetic field, what an observer would see if for each magnetic field line we have at this height, we excite either a, a, a transverse or a perpendicular velocity perturbation. Or in this case, it's going to be like a like an authentic or, or a fast like slash, slash uh, authentic slash uh, slow mode. What are we gonna see? So if we do that, if we just calculate what will an observer see as Doppler velocity, as uh, in in one of those cubes at the formation height uh, at the formation height interface of the different spectral diagnostics we have, we. Um, we get the following curves. Basically, the center to limb variation is different for the different uh, is different for the different magnetic field topologies, which is great. The, uh, but oh, it's great because we can we can measure the magnetic field on the sun. Especially with this, we will be able to. That would be a, a reasonable measurement to, uh, that we're going to have soon. So by by knowing that, we will be able to actually. Uh, we would be able to say, oh, we're either in the top or the bottom regime. And by knowing that, we would be able to constrain the shape of these curves based on the, on the mixture of perpendicular and parallel pertur uh, velocity perturbations for the different um, uh, for the for the different cases, for the different magnetic field topology cases. So now, uh, but the, really to solve this problem, it's not that simple by just using the the, the toy model for, for many reasons we can discuss later. But what I'm working on right now is actually I have the Bifrost cubes that I have interpolated on a slanted grid. And I resample the plasma parameters on the slant on the on the slanted grid and then I do the relative transfer of the like one, one D relative transfer on the slanted grid, which would give me the synthetic observables what the observer is going to see as if they're looking close to the to the limb. And the second step of this analysis would be to compare the sent the wave amplitudes we see as Doppler velocities to the uh, actual velocity fields at the high deformation uh, and compare those with observed center to limb variation. And I think that would be a a wave a way to constrain this mix of how much perpendicular and uh, parallel uh, velocity perturbations we have. And I think that would be a very tight constraint on the authentic wave on the authentic wave energy budget in the uh, solar chromosphere. And I'm, I've came to my conclusions in future work, uh, which I, of, of course, like the first thing we found was that the, our analysis of Alma and Ibis suggests that the quiet chromosphere, uh, quiet sun chromosphere is most probably not maintained by acoustic waves. However, we, I, I think more uh, further modeling effort, efforts are required as I showed you, as our more realistic um, so, solar models point toward the fact that using 1D static models in a perturbative manner are not uh, are not an accurate representation of the very dynamic and, co and corrugated and height chromosphere. Um, I think the next big thing would be using the very, uh, the very accurate and precise measurements from VISP would be to measure the chromospheric magnetic fields. And uh, having that topology and linking that to the observed velocity fluctuations, we might be able to start looking for image uh, wave model in identification and uh, instead of using that very simplistic acoustic wave model we might be actually plugging in a bit more complicated uh, a bit more complicated wave energy density in that uh, first equation I showed you and we have an accepted proposal for that and we're waiting on the data from the biggest um, next the center field variation of the velocity fluctuations could provide a spectroscopic constraint of the authentic wave amplitudes which is important for uh, all sorts of heating theories of the solar outer layers. And with VISP, we would again be able to pr uh, 
to constrain that magnetic topology, I sort of decides which mo which model uh, we need to use to interpret our data. And another step that I'm looking uh, forward to is like actually to explore other relative, ma relative magnetic hydrodynamic models like Muron to see um, how the previous analysis changes based on uh, different implementations of the of the code, including like different topo magnetic topo <clears throat> sorry different magnetic topologies different uh, relative transfer implementations and other details of the code. And something we're currently working on is actually to see if we can explore and extract a bit more out of the phase delay um, diagrams from actual synthetic chromospheric diagnostics, like something similar to what Bernard Fleck did in uh, last year in a paper, uh, or did this year, I guess. Uh, but that's still work in progress. And uh, yeah, th those are my conclusions and uh, future work aspects. And I'd love to take your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Mamchi, for a nice presentation. Excellent job. Now it's open <clears throat> for questions. Rebecca. Hi, Momo. Uh, nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, actually, you answered one of my questions in your conclusion slide. I was going to ask about magnetic diagnostics and how could that help you constrain um, uh, these um, uh, MHD modes. But my other question was um, related to the center to limb variation uh, studies. I was wondering whether in your modeling you're also considering pixel foreshortening as you get closer to the limb. And you know, the geometric extent of pixels really close to the limb varies really fast. And in those observations that you showed, I was wondering how much impact that foreshortening, changing of foreshortening happened, uh, affects um, the velocity amplitudes. That's a very good question. Um, I can't answer it right now, but I think based on the, based on the, before simulation results, I think I'll be able to give a better, more realistic constraint. On yeah, that. That, that will be. Yeah, that will be great. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope that answers the question because I, I don't have a. No, uh, no. That, okay, that, that, yeah, I was just wondering whether it was yeah. something that you were considering and taking into account at all. Uh, yeah, oh, that's a good, that's a good point to take it into. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Other questions? Gabriel. Thank you. Uh, hey, Momo, do you mind explaining again how, going back to the slide with, um, to, uh, yeah, that one. Try to exp explain again how, so first question is this, what you're showing here, does this plot sort of contradict the observation that the, um, the change, the the amplitude changes in the intensity, the uh, decreases towards the limb, whereas the top. This is the velocity oscillation. Velocity, yeah, that's what I meant. So, but they're looking at different velocity oscillations. You're looking at, I guess, you're looking at Doppler changes and the intensity. The intensity changes due to the temperature oscillations, right? From the compressor. Yes, weight. yes, yes. So I was so, just curious how you interpreted that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I think that these changes with uh, a new, uh, I don't think in first approximation, if you observe a, uh, a blob of plasma at uh, like a shock front going up, I think if its brightness is is determined by one like by a wave if you observe it at an angle that won't, won't change its intensity so i think these are just uh, signatures of compressive waves whereas these what i'm showing here i think would be a combination of both compressive and uh, com uh waves that don't create compression like an authentic wave thank you yeah that that makes and and before that though you were showing a chain you were showing a graph that was showing a decrease in the velocity but that oh that but that was for different inclinations of the magnetic field right because here you're showing quiet sun yes okay right on i Thank have you. no um yes I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to explain this data yet but i think 
So that's still something yes. unusual. Yes. Okay. Well, but a, a, a plan of mine is to include a little bit more data because these are just five different data sets. Like each one of these points is actually a distribution of points. And uh, I, I think I can include significantly more um, observations, but, but I need to be careful with the, I need to be careful with the observation parameters that have a homogeneous ob observation set that I don't introduce biases based on the fact that I don't know, I have like longer exposure times or like, um, like longer exposure times that actually start eating into my uh, cadence and stuff like that. So uh, that's something I'm working on right now as well. Awesome. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Adams, you uh, raised your hand. Are you there? Adams? I don't see him in the list. He raised his hand. Anyone else? So, um, any other questions for Manchil? Um, I have one since uh, he brought uh, into the discussion the whisper. I, I like to know uh, what is the time cadence of the observations that you need to achieve, uh, especially, you know, with the calcium age. I presume that your proposal uh, uh, takes advantage of uh, the frozen configuration for the first year of commissioning, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you're so you're you're expecting to to do this uh, stratification uh, using uh, iron lines and then the two calcium to lines uh, eighty five forty two with calcium H. So at calcium H we have uh, very little photons. Uh, mm -hmm. I presume that uh, we can have uh, sufficient time cadence to do some. Uh, uh, magnetic diagnostic using calcium 8542, but it's probably going to be hard uh, to do the same uh, with the calcium H. So if uh, calcium H uh, is only used uh, for uh, um, fast t intensity time series, what, what, what is the, the, the time cadence that, that you are expecting uh, you will need so that you know one can plan ahead and... Uh... Um, I. I uh, don't remember the details of the proposal, but I remember that we proposed to do uh, aver like the observation would start with a long uh, raster that's going to be deep. So we're not going to be actually measuring the magnetic field, but we're going to, uh, sorry, we're not going to be uh, measuring the velocity as much as the magnetic field topology of the region we're going to scan. And then we're going to have a, a fast scan that I think was like faster than 10 seconds. I, I think it was like for the whole raster, it was going to be a very narrow raster. And we were mostly concentrating on the, I think the iron lines and the calcium to 8542 line was the data product we we're looking at mostly. And uh, that, that would have a temporal resolution of, of a cadence of a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, I remember that um, we were trying to have at least uh, a signal to noise ratio greater than a few hundred for the line core of the 8542. Like, I think we have optimized our um, observations around uh, the 8542 line in our proposal. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for uh, Mamtil? I don't see any other hands raised. Um, if I am missing, please jump in directly. If not, let's thank the speaker again for an excellent presentation. Oh, th thanks. Thank you, Mom, Th Thanks for having me. Thank you. Oh. Um, thank I'm, you. I'm glad, it was, I'm glad. I'm glad. I hope I explained stuff clearly enough. <laughs> I think you did. Okay. <laughs> At least for me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mama. Yeah. Bye.
Thanks so much for organizing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Momo. Yeah. Okay. Well, th thanks. I'm going to leave, leave now.